everyone. My name is Sanjeev Goyal. Welcome to my show, Impact Video Series, where we invite thought leaders and innovators to discuss their approach of the future, especially in post-pandemic world. Today, I have invited an exceptional guest and dear friend of mine, Chester Santos. He doesn't need any introduction. He is the International Man of Memory. He has left an impression on all corners of Earth. He was a software engineer in his past life. He turned International Memory Man. Let's talk to him and find out how a software engineer become an expert of memory. He's being featured on CNN, ABC, PBS, NBS, CBS, BBC. Man, how many C's are there, Chester? <laughs> That's funny, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's a famous keynote speaker and several celebrities come to learn from him that how they can be better. He's not an IITian, but he teaches IITians today. Welcome to our show, Chester. Thank you so much for having me, Sanjeev. I'm looking forward to talking with you today. So Chester, I have an easy question for you. I know a little bit about your journey and how a software engineer become an expert, but our audience may not know you. Would you mind sharing with them your journey? Yeah, no problem. So it's kind of, uh, I think, random <laughs> a bit, the story. I mean, you wouldn't uh, normally hear about something like this. So I was working as a software engineer in Silicon Valley. I have a master's degree in software engineering. And, you know, just on the side, I started memory training, training my mind and memory, because I happened to catch a segment one night after after work, just flipping channels, I, I caught a segment on this evening news program. It's called 2020. Some people may have heard about it. There was a segment on the United States Memory Championship. And it kind of sparked my interest because I would get the comment a lot. Just people would say to me, wow, you have a really good memory. I would get that comment a lot in conversation. So with that kind of in the back of my mind, when I saw this episode, I said, hey, maybe I can do well in this national memory competition. Um, so I started looking into it. I found what the best people in the country were scoring in these various events in the United States memory championship. It was memorizing decks of cards, hundreds of names, hundreds of computer generated random digits in just wow. a few minutes perfectly. Yeah. It's crazy stuff what they do in this competition. So I, I quickly found out that, you know, although I probably really was, quite above average in terms of memory just to begin with, I was nowhere near that level of the best in the country. So I started then doing research. Okay, I'm pretty good now. How can I really magnify my memory? How can I reach these top levels? So I, I read all the books I could find on memory. I did a lot of internet research. I started to experiment with various techniques and just started to find out what was working best for me personally uh, train myself in that subset of techniques that I thought worked the best until eventually I did manage to win the United States Memory Championship. And really since then, I've gone on to train other people around the world. So it's so been we, more uh, than 10 years. Chester, yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, you won the America's Memory Championship. How long you yeah. prepared for that? Yeah, so I spent probably, again, I was working full time as a software engineer. So for probably a couple of years, it was just a little bit on my spare time. So maybe, you know, an hour after work once in a while, maybe a little bit more on the weekends. Eventually, I felt pretty confident that I could do uh, at least somewhat well in this uh, U.S. memory championship. So I entered and I took third place uh, the first time. So I knew that I, I was almost there, you know, that I could win it. Uh, I ended up going back. I kept getting third place. And then uh, finally one year I made it just like my mission in life to win this thing because I knew if I could take third, I could take 
first. Um, so that year I became kind of obsessed actually with winning it. Um, this was in two, the year 2008. And after, you know, working a full day as a software engineer, when I got home, I would actually study memory techniques for like three to four hours. And then on the weekends, I would spend like four plus hours a day. So, so I just put I in the say, extra effort. So Chester, can I say that uh, memory, we all have phenomenal memory. We just have, we don't have the right training to leverage it or to tap into that. Yeah, so really that, that's my message that I am trying to get across to people around the world now, presentations in, in over 30 countries at this point for various types of organizations, really anyone out there, no matter what your current backgrounds, you really can develop an amazing ability to remember things given just the right techniques and a little bit of training and practice. And really any career, IT, I would say, is actually one of the ones that can maybe stand to most benefit from it because it, things are changing so quickly. There's a lot of new processes, procedures, different uh, commands, software you're working with. It's changing so quickly. Uh, the ability to learn and commit things to memory is going to benefit you a lot, uh, definitely in IT, but really just about any career. So I have an interesting question because most of our audience are going to be from technology. And uh, we both saw evolution of internet and how internet has connected all of us uh, to this level that we can have a communication with anyone globally, literally on a video, which was uh, like a dream 30 years ago or 25 years ago. Even. And now everybody's talking about AI, artificial intelligence. And it seems like in Silicon Valley, we talk about it, that are we going to outsource the job of thinking to computers? Then what will humans do? What is your take on that, specifically from memory perspective? Yeah, so, you know, nowadays, uh, part of what I'm trying to maybe, I guess, warn people about a bit is that Nowadays, the average person is losing their, uh, their memory ability, really. Just, uh, I would say, the average business professional, their memory level is quite a bit lower nowadays than it was 10 or 20 years ago because now we're outsourcing our memory and other mental functions to electronic devices. And I, I say, you know, go ahead and use these devices for what is very useful, how they can make you more efficient on the job more productive, but let's be a little bit wary of letting them do everything for us. Um, let's make it a point to use our memory and other mental functions. We're, we're in an age of a little bit uh, of dangerous digital dependency. We don't want to lose basic mental functions because the internet, you know, Zoom, uh, you know, and other services that you, you, like you mentioned, these video calls, all of this amazing technology that we're able to use now, let us not forget <laughs> that it all came really from the power of the human mind, right? The human brain. So we want to continue to develop our brain, work on maintaining, uh, and also further developing our mental abilities. I completely agree with you on that, Chester. And, um, you know, uh, two things I always say that uh, possibly uh, they are right. For example, we talk about driving. So self-driven cars uh, will be real very, very soon. We already have an amazing, uh, uh, amazing cars on the street. And that's going to improve or change the way we do transportation. But that doesn't mean that uh, we are able to solve all the problems. There are still phenomenal problems we have in front of us, uh, including the current pandemic. Uh, we have so much uh, information, but we don't know what is right, what is wrong. We don't know how to even react to all these things. We don't know how to even cure this virus. I know there are several uh, vaccines out, but we don't know what is the end uh, result of all these vaccines because it's too early to say these vaccines will cure us for long term. There are se several problems. So as a human, we will continue to find new challenges, new problems. So coming back to the memory, I know that you can remember a deck of cards in just seconds or minutes. Should I say second or milliseconds? 
Well, um, I used to be able to do it in less than 90 seconds. Wow. There are people nowadays, some of the best uh, guys in the world nowadays can even memorize it, a deck in less than 30 seconds. But I used to be under, under 90 seconds for a deck of cards, yeah. So help me understand, how does that even work? I mean, for me, I don't even remember the name of the people I met five minutes ago. How will you do that? Yeah, so it's just training and practice with the right techniques. Uh, Really, there are three main principles. Uh, One principle is take whatever it is that you want to remember. So it could be something abstract like a playing card, could be someone's name, and turn it first into a visual, something that you can picture in your mind. So in the case of Mike, uh, I might, uh, the name Mike, I might picture a microphone. If I'm meeting someone named Alice, I might picture a white rabbit because that reminds me of Alice in Wonderland. So somehow take the information, turn it into something you can picture because we're very good at remembering things that we see. Um, that's principle one. Principle number two is try to involve additional senses as you can from there because as you add more senses, when trying to encode information into your memory, you're activating more and more areas of your brain and you're building more and more connections in your mind to the information, making it easier to retrieve it later. So I was on this show, PBS Nova Science. People can find the episode online, watch it for free if they want later. And they had these brain scientists, come on, neuroscientists. And these neuroscientists needed to explain for people at home, okay, how, how in the world does, how can Chester do this? How's he doing these crazy memory feats on the show. And the brain scientists confirmed that it's because with these types of techniques that I've mastered, I'm using more of the brain. Uh, and anyone, anybody can do this. Part of this is learning to use those additional senses to use more of your brain. And then just the last principle to keep in mind is while you are seeing and experiencing these things happening, try to make it all weird, unusual in some way, because there is a psychological aspect to human memory that applies to all of us with putting forth little to no effort we all remember things that catch us by surprise right that are really weird in some way sanjeev if it if an elephant crashed into the room that you're in right now if that actually happened you'd probably remember that for the rest of your life and tell that story even 30 years from now You're, you're you won't believe this i was interviewing my friend chester this memory guy for my my interview series and an elephant crashed into the room that could be stuck in your head for 30, 40 plus years, but you wouldn't even need to try to commit that to memory. So this psychological aspect to memory, realizing it's there, we can harness it and apply it to things that would be pretty useful, processes, procedures, training material, names to get more out of networking, to build better relationships with people uh, in general. There are so many really practical applications, again, for improving your ability to remember things. Oh, absolutely, Chester. And, you know, when, uh, especially when I meet people, when I talk to people, they always talk about that. Hey, Sanjeev, you are really, really good in connecting the dots and uh, how you do that. And I say, hey, it seems pretty natural to me, but I agree with you. There are a lot of training, and a lot of uh, things I have picked up over the years, some knowingly, some unknowingly. I agree with you. If I can harness my brain a little better, and there are a lot of studies around it that what percentage of brain we use and how we leverage that. So help me understand when we talk about brain, for us to learn anything, what it takes, is it just the commitment? Is it the sheer desire or passion or something else? How do we really well, it, learn? It, it, Yeah, so you know, all of that is involved. So learning and memory will always come down to creating a connection in your mind between something new that you're trying to learn and something that you already know, right? That's how we make sense of it. That helps us commit it to memory, helps us to understand it. So we're always trying to somehow link in our mind something new, something that we already know. Um, And there are various ways as to how you can create that connection. I do it with these sort of Uh, visual-based techniques, but there are a lot of ways. But that motivation that you talked about comes into play as well also, right? Because we, of course, automatically remember more, even with no techniques or training, what we pay more attention to, what we focus more on, right? So part of what I'm doing is helping to make things that at first might not be so interesting 
to you so you don't focus on it so much but you need to you need to know it for your career right or at least it would be very uh useful for you to know it i i kind of help to make that a bit more interesting so that you will pay more attention more focus to um put more focus on many more things once you have this uh more interesting i guess approach to to memory so interesting so because i always wonder and uh, you know since i'm from uh, IIT. Uh, I personally, uh, there are very, very smart people. I, I consider myself uh, fortunate and lucky to get there, but uh, we all know what is the definition of luck. But there were a lot of phenomenal uh, students and uh, friends I made, and they were really a lot smarter than me. What I find very interesting is people who are doing better than me, they have this very unique ability to process information. They could process information far better and more effectively than me. And they were able to connect that information with different aspect of things around them in a different way, in a succinct way. For example, uh, let's talk about even health data today. We are not able to layer different kind of data set even today. We don't know what it means. For example, the kind of things you purchase in a grocery store, uh, the kind of ads, you see on the TV or uh, on internet, and the kind of food you eat. We all know uh, benefits of exercising and all, but how do you combine all of these and create some kind of patterns which can help us live better? So for example, one of my friend uh, has started this company. They are using this uh, DNA testing, or I will say biome testing, and based on that, they are prescribing supplements you should be taking and things you should or shouldn't be eating. I find all these things very fascinating. It seems like each of us, we look same, but we all are very, very unique. What do you think about that? Are we really yeah, unique? Yeah, so, yeah, we're all, well, definitely are all very unique in many different aspects. And in terms of, you know, my area of learning and memory, we're all unique in the way we we tend to learn things. What I will say related to what you were talking about with your friends that some, you know, some are able to process things in in very interesting, unique ways. Um, you know, that stems a lot from having a really broad knowledge base, I feel. So the more knowledge you have in many different areas, the better able you are to make the, you know, process the information in a different way, right? So in other words, if you have someone, they have uh, this knowledge in one thing and maybe just this other thing and they're presented with something new, they would process it that, you know, one, a certain way, right? Sure. But you have someone else that has knowledge in one, two, three, four, five different areas. Now they're presented with that same new thing. They'll process it completely differently because they have a much broader knowledge base, right? So they're sure. able to generate uh, new ideas that the person that only had knowledge in the two areas wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible for them because they were lacking that knowledge, right? So um, more knowledge, I think, is is definitely can lead to more uh, power. And, you know, learning and memory is part of developing that knowledge base, broadening uh, your, you know, things that you know from many different areas. It's going to help improve creativity, imagination, and, and, and all sorts of things. So stuff your brain with as much information as possible is what I advise. I, I encounter people, and you, you've probably heard it as well, people that say, you know, I don't want to learn all this useless information, or I don't want to clutter my brain, uh, and things like that, but, you know, they think that it's going to hurt them when they want to learn something that they think yeah. is important, but it, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Because learning and memory comes down to creating a connection in your mind between something you already know and that's something new that you're trying to learn, it's to your benefit to learn as much as possible and stuff your brain with as much information as possible. So that is very interesting. Uh, that's uh, popular to contrary belief because uh, we yeah. want to learn the things which are more uh, relevant and important to us. So yep. if you push it a little bit further, uh, Chester, uh, the challenge is there is so much out there. The information, we have kind of an information overload as you and me both know. You don't want to clutter your brain. We both know that. So how do you ensure what kind of content or what information should you consume? What kind of information or content you should not consume? Because 
that impact our cognitive skills as well as that impact our uh, decision making we both know that so but that's a conversation for some other day how do we decide what to learn what not to learn maybe we can train our mind to focus on the things which is important to us and that can be a learned skill that's what i'm hearing from you am i right yeah definitely so it's going to be you know yeah i would totally advise just concentrating on the things that you feel are important to learn and that would benefit you um and Again, it can be easier for you to do that if you master these types of uh, memory techniques that I teach people. Really, what I think happens is that you know that learning, you know, A, B, and C could benefit you, but you're like, maybe I'll just learn A because B and C is too much. I don't want to clutter my brain with too much at this moment what I was saying is that actually it's going to really benefit you more than you might believe to learn A, B, and C. And with these types of techniques, um, you're not going to experience as much difficulty learning that information. And there is really no such thing as too much information in your brain. But yeah, definitely you'd want to tackle one thing at a time and you would know best, uh, you would know better than anyone else what you think is better to concentrate on first. So let's talk about uh, some of your celebrity uh, friends and the people who comes to you. Is there anybody yeah. you can name and talk about them and how their life has changed after they have gone through this process of learning with you? Yeah, so many people and, you know, they come to me for different reasons. And, you know, so they've been helped in, in various ways, depending on what it is they're trying to accomplish. People can check me out on Instagram, Chester J. Santos on Instagram, if they want to see pictures of people that I've worked with over the years. One recent was I was hired to uh, train the world. He was the former world heavyweight champion uh, in uh, boxing. David Hay is his name. He's also one of only two boxers in history, um, along with Evander Hol Holyfield to unify the cruiserweight title. So a legendary boxer. They wanted me to train him for this documentary film that followed him making the transition from professional boxer to professional poker player. So in this particular case, he was just having difficulty remembering even his cards for, for various reasons. You know, he oh. wasn't... He didn't necessarily have the, the focus and, you know, things were distracting him a bit. But the two in Texas Hold'em is the particular game, Hold'em Poker, where you have those whole cards. And he could, however, remember them, for instance, as most people do, if it's a pair or something like that. Or you have really good cards, right? So when you see that, everybody naturally, you remember that, right? More easily than if you have, like, a couple of, pretty random cards like seven and five that you know they're not necessarily that great um their strength is kind of just somewhere in the intermediate or, or low range um he would then look at the cards a lot so basically people could tell um whether he had a good hand by the fact of whether or not he was looking at the cards a lot so i was able to get him to where he could not only remember the two cards that he had, uh, the whole cards, but also even up to five plus hands that he was dealt in a row. Wow. Uh, and that came with just, yeah, that came, we did a, an exercise where I'll deal five in a row and he could tell you all, all 10 cards in a row. So um, it was just learning these types of techniques and a little bit of training and practice. So that's one example, one story there, but people can, can look on my Instagram and see, you know, I've worked with politicians that, you know, sometimes they want to be able to remember presentations. They want to be able to remember names to get more out of uh, networking, to build better business uh, relationships. Um, so, yeah, you can check out my Instagram to see. I've worked with music people, people from the music industry. Yeah, That's pretty cool. So any bizarre story you can share from your uh, so many years of a speaking engagement? You are a keynote speaker and several conferences, including... Uh, you were supposed to go for Thai India last year as a keynote, right? Yeah, so there was one in India that I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to make it to the Thai conference. Uh, actually, there was just a, a, a conflict there. But um, 
uh, I did the World AI Show. Um, it's another yeah. conference. I did that last year. World AI, Mumbai, actually. That's impressive. Yeah, you are teaching <laughs> AI geeks uh, memory training. Why do they need training, man? <laughs> they, they are like yeah, so, geeks. You put everything in computer. Yeah, so it was for the World AI, World AI Show. Yeah, so a lot of um, not only individual uh, engineers, but really big companies that are, are really focused on developing, you know, the future of AI. I was a speaker there in Mumbai, but you know, what I brought up again is what I mentioned, you know, all of this stuff comes from the power of the human mind. And also another thing that comes to mind is that in these, these Instagram posts that I do, I do tips from around the world. So I visit famous locations from all over the world and I talk about how that location in some way relates to the brain and memory. And I remember doing one from this location in Hawaii where they filmed some movies and TV shows. So I know Lost, the TV show was filmed there, Avatar, some scenes from Avatar were filmed there. And I was talking about, you know, with these fantastical themes in mind, let's just imagine that one day some alien race attacks us or some AI that we create becomes way too powerful and decides, you know what, it's going to limit our access to certain electronic devices or it's going to limit our access to the internet, whatever it wants to take control of. What if that happens? We're going to be in really big trouble if we've lost all of our mental abilities. We've lost our ability to uh, acquire and maintain our knowledge because we were just reliant on the technology. It's going to be a really scary situation for us at the time it seemed really ridiculous and maybe it kind of does now as well but less so because of 2020 and you know what what's happened with the pandemic because if you would have told me this story last year you know it would have sounded like a science fiction you know what what we're living in now would have totally sounded like science fiction to me so let's keep that in mind in terms of ai we don't know what the future holds and uh let's let's keep working on our mental uh, our mental abilities for sure, keeping our brain functions and our knowledge. <laughs> Completely agree. On top of that, uh, Chester, you know, uh, people ask me this question all the time. This is, hey, Sanjeev, you're an expert of AI. You are advising companies and businesses for so long on artificial intelligence and its application. What is your take on that? So my take is very simple. Chester, before computers, we were doing our things. It's not like banking was not functional or healthcare was not functional before computers or before uh, uh, automobile, we were able to transport people from here and there, but the challenge is each time newer technology comes, we have a fear that what is going to happen to the past or the current, and then we realize we all can live a better life. Today, if we talk about quality of life, a lot of people may say it differently, but I truly believe we have far more comfortable life we have more food than we used to. We have better way of distributing food. Uh, we have better healthcare systems. We have better infrastructure. In fact, uh, apart, uh, of course, I'm not happy what happened because of the COVID, but if you really see our world continue to function, in spite of all these issues, we had electricity, we had water, we had people getting healthcare. Yes, there were hospitals packed up. Yes, there were some patients were not getting proper treatment, but financial market, everything was going. You tell me if we can function the way we are functioning today without technology. So we both understand the value of technology. Coming to artificial yeah. intelligence, it's a very similar thing, right? We are going to find ways, how do we harness this new kind of technology, which is artificial intelligence, and then create better infrastructure or better life for all of us, including self-driven cars. Very good example. My parents, they're aging. Your parents, grandparents, they all require better systems to go so they are independent. Self-driven car will do that. Same way, there are several other things we are trying to do which will improve our quality. Now, coming back to these kind of decision-making, these decision-making can completely change because we are not done with problems yet. We still have so many problems. 
few minutes yeah. ago, we couldn't even have the voice conversation because the Zoom was not working. So let's not go there. We still have so many problems. To solve. <laughs> some things, some things <laughs> to work out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as an explorer, uh, which I always say that humans are explorers, and we are looking, always looking for new frontiers. So we will find new frontiers. We will not stop here. There's so much to learn, so much to grow, and people like you are reminding us that how can we continue to be the student of life, continue to learn every single day, continue to learn from every single thing. Uh, for example, uh, I was talking to one of my friends and he said, you know, everything should be simple. He said, really? Let's talk about it. Is the tree and the leaf on that tree, is it simple? Universe is perfecting every single leaf every single fruit for God knows generations. So complexity is growing, is not reducing. Yes, on the surface, we are trying to simplify things, but in reality, the complexity around the humanity, complexity around every single thing has exponentially grown. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely, I totally do agree. Um, you know, things are uh, becoming more and more, yeah, more and more complex. Um, but we are, I mean, I, I love the direction that uh, we're headed in, um, as you mentioned, with uh, everything we're able to do now that we weren't able to do, you know, in the past. And these things do make our lives easier and more comfortable in many ways. Um, I agree. But yeah, I'm just, uh, I just want to make sure that we don't, again, neglect the basic human mind, uh, human brain, because all of that came from, uh, you know, came from our brain. Well, completely agree, uh, uh, Chester, on that. I echo what you are saying, because we both talk about, we are both a student of life. We are learning every single day that curiosity will continue to help us grow. But if I look back, I believe I'm able to process more information than I used to 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So which is amazing that how that more information, just exactly what you said in the in beginning is, you read more, learn more. It's not about yeah. cluttering your mind. It's about understanding and creating those connections. If you don't even know, how will you create those connections? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Memory, you are an expert of memory and I always want to learn from you. In fact, I have attended one of your course uh, almost five, six years ago in uh, San Francisco. Uh, mm -hmm. You promised to teach our audience some tricks. So is now a good time? Yeah, let's give it a try. I think people will enjoy it. And, you know, I, I like, you know, I always like people to develop new skills. So we're going to, we're going to learn one of these memory techniques here that incorporates those three principles that I went over already earlier, just visualization, try to use other senses as you can and try to make it all weird, unusual, extraordinary. We're going to apply that now to committing to memory, the following random list of words going to be a long list. Monkey, iron, rope, kite, house, paper, shoe, worm, envelope, pencil, river, rock, tree, cheese, and dollar. That's the random word list. Now, a lot of times people think, whoa, man. I'm already I'm lost, man. To, I'm already lost. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to remember that, not, not unless you give me a lot of time to do it. And even if I gave people a lot of time, how they would go about it is just write it out over and over again. They would you know, read it over and over again, recite it to themselves over and over. But instead, we're going to make use of those principles that I talked about earlier to create a little story in our mind. So just visualize what I described to you, Sanjeev. I want, I'm going to use you as the guinea pig. Just do your best. And then people watching this video can follow along and see how they do. So I'm going to describe something to you. Just see and experience it happening in your mind. The first word was a monkey. Monkey. So just see a monkey dancing around. Uh, in your mind, the monkey is making monkey noises, boop, 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 whatever monkey sounds like, right? The point here is to see and hear the monkey. The monkey now picks up a gigantic iron like you would iron your clothes with because that was 
the next word. So just see that happening in your mind. This monkey's dancing around with this giant iron. The iron starts to fall, but a rope attaches itself to the iron. Maybe even feel the rope. Maybe it feels sort of rough. Really interact with that rope. You look up the rope, you see that the other end of the rope is attached to a kite. It's flying around, maybe even try and touch it. All right, kite was the next word. The kite now crashes into the side of a house. Really see it smash into this house. Picture that. You notice now that the house is completely covered in paper. For some strange reason, it's completely covered in paper. Picture that. Paper was next. Out of nowhere, a shoe appears and it starts to walk all over the paper. Maybe it's messing it up as it's walking on it, that shoe. All right. The shoe smells kind of badly, so you decide to investigate and see why. You look inside of that shoe and you find a smelly worm, a little worm crawling around inside of the shoe. The next word was worm. The worm now jumps out of the shoe and into an envelope. Maybe it's going to mail itself or something. I don't know. Envelope was next. All right. Out of nowhere, a pencil appears. It starts to write all over the envelope. Maybe it's addressing it or something, I guess, the pencil, okay? The pencil now jumps into a river and there's a huge splash. For some reason, when that little pencil hits the river, the river, you know, notice, is crashing up against a giant rock, all right? That rock crashes into a tree. The tree is growing cheese. And out of each piece of cheese shoots a dollar, all right? The last word I had given you is dollar. So just see a dollar come out of the cheese there. That was it. Now I'm going to run through this again, but in about 30 seconds, I'm going to run through the story. You'll just try to replay through it in your mind. That's it. So we started off with a monkey, okay? What was the monkey dancing around with? It was dancing around with an iron, okay? Dancing iron. around with an iron. Something attached to it. What was it? It was a rope, rope. all right? The other end of the rope was attached to something. It was a kite. 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 The kite crashed kite. into something. It crashed into a house. Yeah. What was the house covered in? It was covered in paper. paper. So really see the paper. Something walked on that paper. It was a shoe Good. walking around. Really see the shoe. Something was crawling in the shoe. What was it? It was a smelly worm yeah. was crawling in there, right? The worm then jumped into an uh, envelope. Uh, yeah, you got it. Something wrote on the envelope. What was it? It pencil. was a pencil. pencil. Yeah, the pencil jumped into a river, all right? Crashed into the river. The river was splashing up against a rock, Rocks. okay? Yeah, the rock flew into a tree. tree. The tree the tree was growing something. It was growing cheese. cheese. And something came cheese out balls. of the cheese. Make it was a, a do Yeah, nice. And something ah. came out of the cheese. What was it? It was a dollar. A dollar came out of the the cheese. So now what I want you to try to do, and people can follow along with you, Sanji, just do your best um, to try to give me the words by just running through the story in your mind. Mm -hmm. Each major object that you see in the story will give you the next word. Give it a try. Sure. So uh, first one is monkey. Then we had yep. the rope, iron. Then after iron, uh -huh. we have the rope. From the rope, we yep. have the kite. From the kite, yep. we have the house. In the house, we have the paper. From paper, we have the smiley shoes. The smiley shoes, we yep. have the warm. And with the warm, yep. we have the envelope. On the envelope, uh -huh. we have a pencil. On the pencil, yeah. we have the river. After the river, we uh -huh. have the rock. After the rock, yep. we have a, a tree. And from the tree, yep. we have the cheese. And after the cheese, we have a dollar bill. Awesome, man. Nice job. Good, How good did job. I do? I put you under... You got 100%, Sanji. Really, really? well done there. Awesome, man. 100%. Man. Yeah, really well done. And I put so you I can under go pressure for memory there, you know? contest now? Yeah, yeah, you can. I put you under pressure. It's not easy under the pressure there, and you pulled it off 100%. Correct. Great job. So that technique, it's just something called the story method. It's, it's just one of many techniques that memory champions like myself uh, have learned over the years. As you know, they've had me on a lot of different TV shows over the years, Science Channel, Discovery Channel, a bunch of different news shows. They'll have me come on and do something that at first seems like, wow, an extraordinary feat of memory. Then they'll have me give tips for viewers at home. But I want to make it really clear to everybody watching the interview today that there's nothing different about my brain compared to everyone else's. Really, I've just learned these types of techniques that are powerful and effective and I've put in the training and practice. This can be huge for you in terms of memory. It's not just random words. 
you guys, uh, if you look at my website, you'll see they had me um, over at Harvard University. I worked with Harvard graduate students, business students, um, you know, even very complex types of information can be tackled with this. It's about learning how to build mental note cards or mental cue cards. So that monkey can rep represent something broader. You know, you could give a presentation even using this uh, simple story method, minimizing the amount of notes. There are a lot of um, practical uses. It's just using your, you need to use your creativity and your imagination a bit. And something so simple like this can be very powerful and used in many different situations. That's so cool, uh, Chester. I can sit and talk to you for hours and hours. Uh, before uh, we wrap up the meeting or uh, this call, uh, one question I have for you is, actually two. One is, what role curiosity has played in your life and can it be taught? Yeah, really good question there. So the first part is easy. The second part is not so much. So, um, you know, curiosity has pay, played a huge role, obviously, in, in my life. I mean, I'm doing what I'm doing now because I randomly caught a segment on the TV show and I became curious about, you know, learning these memory techniques. Really, um, so many cool things that and skills I've developed over the years uh, that I'm very grateful for are re a result of having that curiosity. So curiosity has played a huge role uh, in my life. Um, even I think developing relationships uh, as well, you know, meeting you, I met you through uh, the Godfather of Las Vegas uh, events, Mark Wayman. And that was, you know, someone brought it up to me many, many years back. And yeah. I was just curious. I was curious about the events. I said, you know, let me just check this out and see what, what it's all about. And, you know, now I've uh, become close friends with you and Mark, and I'm, I'm grateful for those relationships. So a lot of good things that have come into my life are the result of having that curiosity. So that's first part of your question. Second part, whether or not it can be taught, that I don't, I don't really have a good answer um, for you there. I guess, you, I guess you can get into the habit maybe. Um, of being more curious and, and habits, I think, come with positive reinforcement. So think about situations or instances in which your curiosity led to something really good in your life. Think about those, concentrate on those instances, that's positive reinforcement, right? And then maybe curiosity will become more of a habit for you. So Chester, uh, any last message for our audience on this call? I would like to bring you back. We are working on some really thing, really exciting. Uh, just to give a little bit of context, uh, we are uh, reaching out to uh, our alumni in 100 plus countries. Our event is open to all, so it's not only for IIT alumni only. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, you know, maximum number of audience will be from IIT. Almost 40% are either entrepreneur or wannabe entrepreneur. So do you have any message for entrepreneur or a challenge? Yeah, so I'll give one specific to me and then in general. And, you know, if you are, if anything that I talked about on today's call in terms of memory development interests you, and if you want to learn more, my main training website is memoryschool.net. You could visualize a giant maybe fishing net to remember that it's .net. So Go to memoryschool.net if you want to further develop these memory skills. But not now my message will be not just for memory, but for anything that you might be interested in learning or new skills that you might want to develop. Um, there's a quote, a famous quote that I like, and that is that you don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to one day become great, right? Uh, I really like that quote a lot. So my message I think is that when you do have that curiosity and your interest is sparked in developing some sort of new skill or learning something uh, about some new area, um, just get started, you know, don't, don't hesitate, get started. You don't have to be good right now, but you do have to start right now to eventually become really uh, good at it or, or great. So that's my, my closing message, I guess. Well, uh, Chester, there are two things I have learned in our interview today. One big one is we all have great memory. We just need to figure out how to harness it. 
And second is, if you don't start, that's not happening. So you have to start whatever you want to accomplish or whatever you want to do. Once again, Chester, thank you very, very much for joining us, supporting IIT community globally. I'm Sanjeev Goyal, conference chair of IIT2020.org, Pan IIT USA's mega virtual event. Please join us on December 4th and 5th, register. We have phenomenal speakers, phenomenal people coming. It'll be great to have all of you. Please register at iit2020.org. Our event is open to all. Thank you. Thank you for the talk today.